Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Scott Worden, and I'm the director of the Afghanistan and Central Asia Program for the U.S. Institute of Peace. I'd like to thank you all, as well as our esteemed panelists, for taking time out of your business schedules to join us for this important discussion about the ongoing and concerning situation in Afghanistan. We invite everyone to take part in today's conversation by asking a question using the chat box function located just below the video player on the USIP event page. We also ask that you please include your name and specify your affiliation or where you're joining us from when you do ask a question. And finally, you can engage with us and each other on Twitter with today's hashtag, hashtag Afghanistan USIP, all one word. As many of you know, USIP was founded by Congress 35 years ago as an independent, national, and nonpartisan institute dedicated to preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflict. We have been engaged in Afghanistan since 2002, focusing on rule of law, peace building, and inclusive governance, and those tasks have been, never been more urgent than they are today. It's been nearly five months since the Taliban took control of Kabul and the Afghan Republic, the Democratic Republic, collapsed. There's been a reduction in violence since the Taliban's military victory with the end of the insurgency, but the hardship for many Afghans has increased as the economic and humanitarian emergency replaces the insurgency as the biggest threat to the Afghan people. The UN issued yesterday an unprecedented $4.5 billion appeal for humanitarian assistance in 2022 and noted that a majority of Afghans face acute hunger and severe poverty in the coming months. The humanitarian disaster that people have been predicting is now upon us. The causes of the current crisis are complicated, and they include sanctions uh, and the withdrawal of donor funding for a Taliban regime that is unrecognized and includes leaders on terrorist sanctions lists. Beneath that, however, are much broader governance deficiencies the Taliban have, including ethnic exclusion, a total lack of technical capacity, and rollbacks on human and women's rights. The governance gap, its implications, and possible ways to address it are the focus of today's conversation. To engage in that discussion, we have an excellent lineup of experts joining us. After introducing them, I will ask them a few rounds of questions as the moderator, and then invite audience participation. Please again, place your questions in the chat box on the event page, and we will select from that list. Our first panelist is Ramatullah Amiri, who is a researcher and analyst with the Liaison Office in Kabul and an independent consultant with deep experience as a researcher focusing on peace, reconciliation, humanitarian access, and social political issues. We're also joined by Pawasha Kakar, who is USIP's Acting Director for Religion and Inclusive Societies, Pawasha previously worked at the Asia Foundation in Kabul, where she was the Director for Women's Empowerment and Development. Asfandir Mir recently joined USIP as a senior expert in the Asia Center. Previously, he was a fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. His research interests include international relations of South Asia, U.S., counterterrorism policy, and political violence, and he focuses on Afghanistan and Pakistan in particular. And finally, Andrew Watkins is a senior expert on Afghanistan with USIP after joining us from the International Crisis Group, in addition to years of experience analyzing security risks for NGOs in Afghanistan. So let me now, without further ado, begin. And Amiri, let me ask you a question uh, about the current situation on the ground. I know you've been in close contact both with Taliban as well as civil society leaders, and you've studied the Taliban for many years. How would you describe the current conditions in Afghanistan? How bad is the humanitarian economic crisis that I mentioned? And is it affecting all parts of Afghanistan equally, would you say? Uh, thank you, Scott, for having me on this panel with this amazing panelist. Uh, just to start, uh, the situation is uh, pretty bad right now. Um, so the crisis uh, in Afghanistan, this humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, just didn't start with August 15, uh, 2021, the, with the uh, collapse or fall of the republic. Um, it was before that, uh, many years before that, the situation in the villages were horrible. But uh, unfortunately, nobody reported. With the collapse in uh, August 15, 2021, 
Taiwan, what happened is that a new disaster uh, uh, started, uh, besides the, the disaster that was already happening in the villages and remote areas. And this disaster was mainly, uh, this disaster hit mainly the urban areas, the major cities, um, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that work for the Afghan government, NGOs, uh, and other, they just lost their jobs and their daily income was uh, being hit hard. And uh, so what happened, uh, and then in the meantime, the banking system collapsed, uh, you know, uh, and what happened is that these all uh, crises came together and made a mess uh, in Afghanistan right now. Uh, for example, if you go to eastern Afghanistan, uh, thousands of people were working for NDSF, um, and now they're jobless. Their families, their families were dependent on those uh, salaries, but they no longer have those uh, salaries coming. And uh, for example, before the fall of the Republic in 20, uh, August 15, 2021, uh, the situation, for example, in Zulma, some villages uh, that I visited uh, uh, back then, uh, actually some literally told me that they eat grass, uh, it's, it's, they eat just bread. Uh, they have nothing else. They borrow flour from, from the from the family, but uh, because of the restrictions uh, by the donors back then, that you know, uh, you cannot work in the Taliban control area, or you know, uh, you don't have to pay the uh, and also the problems from the Taliban side because they ask for the you know uh, the, the, the the tax, and this created a huge uh, things um, in those areas. And plus, in some areas, Taliban at all didn't allow uh, any aid and donor agencies because they accuse him of spying and other things, especially in the southern Afghanistan. So this, what created it was uh, was sort of a system that nobody knew that, okay, what's going on in those um, villages and areas? And completely those signs were ignored. And then when this crisis happened and combined with those others, it just uh, created the um, a huge uh, uh, humanitarian disaster. And right now, I mean, the banking system, everything that is collapsed, uh, it's uh, making it further and further uh, worse. Uh, uh, you know, uh, people don't know what to do. A lot of people are fleeing to Iran and other uh, countries uh, to, they think that they can, um, uh, besides security reasons, they think that they can find some sort of jobs and they can send some money. And um, so, yeah, so right now it's, it's, it's a mess. Uh, 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 Scott. Thanks for that. A difficult situation. Let me ask in your analytical view, how you think the Taliban are perceiving the situation and, and their situation as now leaders of the country? Uh, I think a lot of people, and including some Taliban, have said that the, the their complete takeover was a surprise and it happened more quickly than, than even they expected. So, <laughs> You know, in some senses, is this a case of be careful what you wish for? Now, now they're in charge of a government that, as you said, had lots of or a state that had lots of problems before, uh, and then uh, sanctions and other issues compound that. Um, what's their perception or approach to governance now that they are in charge? I think one of uh, their problems is that still the, they still don't own uh, the crisis. Uh, that's one of uh, the thing. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's not just because of them. It's also the international community, the way they're dealing with them, you know, that uh, make them hold accountable for the crisis. Uh, you know, they accuse the international community for creating the crisis. Therefore, they have to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, find a way to, to, to solve this crisis. And this crisis cannot be solved by humanitarian crisis. It's a political crisis. The Taliban are thinking it's not a political crisis. Without you know, so without solving the political side of this crisis, I don't think the humanitarian side will have a sustainable solution. You know, and uh, Taliban. I mean, uh, the issue uh, with them is that they're very good when it comes to implementations. But the thing is, they don't have the means and resources. You know, um, uh, they don't. Uh, you know, for the means and resources, because the international community doesn't want to work with them uh, on any of them. Things. Uh, yes, behind the doors, they work with them, like, for example, from the UN and others, they work with them in some uh, respects, in some ways. But for how long? And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, the question is 
not just that, you know, they work with them, but the thing is how sustainable are those? I mean, if it's not today, if tomorrow they're going to, they have to come up and step up, you know, the international community will like the way they did the withdrawal in, in August 15, you know, 2021, they will also say, well, this crisis is enough, enough. So I think, um, you know, that, uh, that, that the lack of owning the, 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 the problem and coming up with solutions that we don't see at this point in time, you know, that, and that solution is not that, you know, they think that, you know, if you give us the money, we will solve. No, I mean, that's the problem. They have to first come up with the political solutions because the moment they have a political solutions, they will have, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, they will find ways how to work with the international communities. When they find a way to work with the international communities, then they will have the resources and collaborations and partnership with the international community, how to, you know, come up with the long-term solutions and ways to deal with this. But right now, you know, just uh, because, you know, they're ready tomorrow to work with the human in humanitarian crisis, but the international community will not work with them, you know, because that's, that's not, so it's not just uh, a black and white picture, you know, just, uh, it has so many dimensions, this crisis, uh, Scott. Yeah, thanks for that. I definitely want to come back to the uh, the political side of this, and and we we have ninety minutes because of the complexity of it. Let me uh, let me just turn next to to Paul Washa, and we talked about the the scope of the humanitarian crisis. And I mentioned at the top, there's also a, I think a rights crisis, a human rights crisis, a women's rights crisis. Uh, people have been quite critical of the Taliban's rollback on rights. People are especially fearful of a return to the the particularly restrictive and, and even, I would say, abusive policies of the Taliban in the 90s. And I'm wondering, from what you're hearing, from what you're observing, uh, what is the state of the rights rollback now? How uh, realistic is, is it for the Taliban to improve on the record of the, of the 90s? Uh, have they moderated at all? And, and what are you hearing from the ground? Thank you for that question, Scott. It's a really difficult one to answer. And in fact, what we're hearing from the ground from many of our partners and those that we work with is that this seems to be just tactics, that the Taliban, um, their, their difference of approach, where they're now allowing girls, say, up to sixth grade in uh, around Afghanistan to go to school, and then in 19 provinces, uh, allowing some of them to go further on, is just a tactic. And there seems to be this push and shove between communities and the Taliban, where the Taliban will implement something, and then the communities will protest, and then they'll come back, and they'll say, OK, well, now we're going to open it back up, or we're going to do something different. Um, and it's just uh, people feel like they're just being played with and that this is something temporary until they receive, until the Taliban receive enough international attention, enough international aid um, and recognition. And so there's a lot of women that are worried and also men that are worried that if this turns into international recognition, the Taliban will just go right back, revert right back to the 1990s. Um, some of the things that we're seeing, of course, I talked about education, um, uh, there, there's some difficulties in healthcare. We heard in Faria where the Taliban went and spoke to the female doctors and actually told them, you know, you shouldn't be doing X, Y, and Z. You need to limit, uh, for example, your, uh, um, treatment of men. You're not allowed to treat men. You're not allowed to, to prescribe certain drugs. Those kinds of things were limitations were given on them. And then we're seeing in the justice sector where, um, no female lawyers, no female judges are allowed at all. Not, the Independent Bar Association has completely um, been dismantled and been brought under the Ministry of Justice. So there's all these things. And what we're observing also is that women are not going to courts. Uh, they're not being observed in courts. And this is even something worse than the past. In the 90s, women did go to courts where, where the Taliban were presiding, and now we're not seeing that as well. And they're feeling that they're not safe. So those are a number of areas. Um, the Taliban have intensified their crackdown just in the last week on women. Um, we've seen that protesters in Polisurk area of Kabul um, were, were actually beaten because of not observing appropriate Islamic hijab. Uh, protesters have been fired upon. Um, and protesters in Kapisa, women, female protesters in Kapisa were um, detained, uh, some the community calls it abducted, uh, arrested, however you want to put it, but they were put in jail and there was a huge community outcry, uh, including from religious leaders 
uh, in the mosques that then uh, eventually led to their release. Uh, but we've heard also unconfirmed reports of protesters in other provinces, female protesters in other provinces um, being detained and um, tortured as well. So that's on the women front. On human rights abuses, we're seeing beyond just women, uh, journalists are being targeted. Uh, we continue to see those security forces uh, being targeted. Revenge killings are happening. Um, even we have reports of doctors being killed. Uh, and these are kinds of things that in the past under the Taliban, there was some sort of a security force that prevented some of this happening. And now it seems like with the uh, jails being open and, and there isn't, um, as much control over criminal activity that all kinds of things like this are, are cropping up. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to mention is those that have shown online dissent um, are also being uh, arrested. We, we saw the prominent uh, Professor Faisalah Jalal being arrested and recently released, and then others who have been arrested that are not as well known, uh, and still it's unknown where they are and when they will be released. Um, so those are some of the things that we're observing right now. Thanks for that. You mentioned tactics, and I want to touch on another dimension uh, that particularly affects women's rights, but but human rights more generally. And the Taliban often have have tried to say encouraging things, at least to to Western audiences, about respecting rights. But there's often added the caveat in accordance with Islam. Uh, now, of course. Islam is a, is, a, is a broad religion, and it's, it's practiced by many in different ways. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what's your take on that caveat? What do the Taliban really mean by that? Is there any clarity about how they will interpret uh, Islam? Uh, is this just a, a way of covering what will really be restrictive rights? Or are they open to debate or dialogue on religious grounds about uh, how, they should, how they should treat uh, social policy in Afghanistan? Scott, I think that that's a really important point because what we're noticing is when they talk about according to Islam or even according to Hanafi jurisprudence, there's this very big discrepancies in how they interpret that and what is in Hanafi jurisprudence, particularly related to women's rights. For example, in Hanafi jurisprudence, um, there is nothing about women covering their faces. Uh, Arwa is not in, the face and the hands are not included as as places that should be covered according to Hanafi jurisprudence. For example, um, in Hanafi jurisprudence, women can be judges. Uh, so there's all of these things that are, uh, and then for example, in Hanafi jurisprudence, there's a, a very big emphasis on. Uh, bay'ah, or pledging of allegiance to the head of state, and, and a head of state being basically elected by the people, by the public. And we have the example of Imam Abu Hanifa himself refusing to pledge allegiance to the Abbasid ruler Mahdi, saying, you haven't been uh, uh, approved by the people, they haven't pledged you allegiance, and you need the public to pledge you allegiance. So these are some of the things that are in Hanafi jurisprudence, specifically Hanafi jurisprudence, that the Taliban claim to follow, and they're not following those things. Um, so it does seem to be very much tactics, very much politics. However, we are seeing some breakthrough moments where, for example, in Herat, the ulama were able to overturn, overturn uh, the Taliban's ruling of closing the women's hammams. And they were saying the, the women's bathhouses, the, the Taliban were saying they needed to be closed. And the ulama there in Herat said, no, this goes against Islamic jurisprudence. Women should have a place to have to be able to wash and clean and make their ablutions and be ready for prayer. And through their fatwas, they were able to overturn that and reopen the hammams. Similarly, with the Kapisa abduction of the women, we saw the outcry from the mosques. The ulama stood up uh, for those women and asked for them to be released. So we're seeing some of these breakthrough moments where the ulama are standing up and there's making some changes. But overall, we're not seeing this. We heard the ulama in Doha uh, speak against um, the Taliban's decision on education, on girls' education. It didn't seem to make a, a, a dent really in, in what they're doing. Uh, we still haven't seen uh, girls' schools above sixth grade open uh, uh, at a large scale in, in Afghanistan, things like that. So, so it's, it's a lot of politics, and, and we're still waiting to see uh, really how that's going to happen. But at this point, it doesn't seem very likely that the religious argument is going to do much without some sort of political backing or some sort of political gain that the Taliban will see out of it. Thanks for that. Uh, again, again, the politics. So we'll we'll definitely flag that as our conversation goes on. Let me turn to Asfandiar uh, and and talk about the a third significant interest, uh, maybe even the most significant U.S. national security interest, which is the terrorism threat that 
Afghanistan poses. Of course, the Taliban uh, committed in the U.S. Taliban agreement to prevent Al Qaeda or other terrorist groups, likely ISIS, from launching attacks from Afghan soil. Um, what's your assessment of one the I guess the sincerity uh, of that? Uh, commitment toward the U.S. and to, to other allies uh, since the Taliban victory. Uh, are they still bound by that? Are they still intending to uh, not allow al-Qaeda or other groups to operate? But also, what's their ability, to, if they are sincere, uh, what's their ability to deliver on counterterrorism commitments considering the, the humanitarian crisis and the, the unrest that persists in the country? Um, thanks so much uh, for this opportunity, uh, Scott, to join this very distinguished group uh, on this really important uh, and, and, and sobering topic. I'm delighted to be here, uh, but also as concerned about uh, the continuing distress uh, that the Afghan uh, people face uh, in, in Afghanistan. Um, you know, the Taliban have uh, been slowly walking back or strongly ca caveating many of their key declarations and commitments on various issues. Uh, that they've made over the last few years. Uh, I think Polosha um, documented or spoke about some of them. Uh, and my uh, assessment is that terrorism and counterterrorism uh, as an issue area is no different. Uh, I don't see real sincerity or commitment on, on part of the Taliban uh, to work with the international community to meaningfully stem the terror threat uh, uh, from Afghanistan in Afghanistan for now. Um, and, you know, the, the Taliban retains strong relationships with various terror groups uh, in the country, despite their commitment as part of the Feb 2020 U.S.-Taliban uh, agreement. Uh, what is most concerning is that they are providing what amounts to de facto political asylum to a lot of groups and their people in the country. Uh, and they've also ensured uh, that key leaders of many of these groups have freedom of movement, uh, the kind of movement, uh, freedom of movement that they did not enjoy prior to August 15, uh, 2021. Uh, groups that are benefiting from the Taliban's uh, support include, in my assessment, Al Qaeda and its uh, local units uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, my sense is that al-Qaeda chief Iman al-Zawahiri remains alive, uh, and he may well be in the Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, border region. Um, could be in Pakistan as well, but I think a reasonable likelihood that he is in Afghanistan. Uh, with a lot of al-Qaeda allies uh, now in key positions uh, in the Taliban's government, uh, my assessment is that the Iran-based al-Qaeda leadership is better positioned than before to relocate to the country if it wants to. Uh, and then perhaps one of the biggest beneficiaries of the Taliban's largesse uh, is the group, the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, TTP or Pakistan Taliban, as it is uh, generally known. Uh, the leadership of this group has stepped up its campaign of violence in Pakistan from bases in, in Afghanistan. Um, in November, there was uh, some glimmer of hope that perhaps the Taliban are going to get serious about the TTP, but restraining the TTP, uh, they brokered a ceasefire between Pakistan uh, and the TTP, but that ceasefire lapsed. Uh, and now the Taliban remain non-committal on the future of TTP in, in Afghanistan. There are various Central Asian jihadis, uh, which have relocated within Afghanistan uh, and continue to steadily uh, build up. Their size is most certainly um, growing. Uh, I think there are efforts for, to further unify uh, some of these Central Asian uh, jihadis uh, to boost their campaigns in, uh, in Central Asian republics. Then there are anti-India jihadis, anti-China jihadis, uh, such as those of the Turkestan Islamic Party. Uh, so that, you know, that's the ecosystem that the Taliban are aligned with. On the other hand, um, you know, I think it's clear more than ever that the Taliban see ISIS in Afghanistan to be one of the most important significant threats they face, perhaps even more significant than the threat um, of due to the humanitarian disaster um, unfolding in the country. They are fighting ISIS, no doubt about it. They're seeking to target the group, especially uh, in, the, in the east of the country. Uh, there's been a major crackdown undertaken by the Taliban, especially in uh, near Nangarhar. Uh, but here is where we are at on that crackdown. You asked about capacity. The Taliban's counterinsurgency uh, 
is relatively indiscriminate. Uh, they are repressing lots of Salafi communities uh, in the east of the country because they see them as associated with or providing for ISIS in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and they're also round, rounding up minorities, political opponents, uh, other vulnerable groups, casting them as ISIS affiliates members um, uh, as well, which I think is, is counterproductive. Uh, so as a result, perhaps there are serious reports of ISIS-K activity in various parts of the country, which previously indicated no meaningful ISIS uh, activity. And to top it off, and I think this is where the international community kind of comes in, Taliban have not been able to detain or neutralize any senior leader of ISIS-K until now. ISIS leaders, Shahab al muhajir Aslam Farooqi, you know, they remain at large, um, and, uh, and Taliban have not been able to, uh, um, to get them. The question is, is capacity the reason the Taliban are not going against some of these uh, major terror groups that they're aligned with? I think it can be, uh, to be fair to the Taliban, uh, but, but they have to actually make that determination that they want to do something about these groups. Uh, but for now, that is not the fundamental reason for Taliban's support or continuing assistance for, for all of these groups. I think reasons of ideology, ideological commitment to the process of jihad, in jihad who subordinate themselves uh, to the Taliban, I think those reasons are more important to the Taliban's calculus than, than considerations of capacity. Thanks. You know, your your description of the of the different regional actors that are coming into Afghanistan raises a, another question, which is when you look at the at the terrorism threat that might emanate from Afghanistan, is it greater, would you say, for the US and our close allies or greater for the region? Uh, and ultimately, are those interests aligned between, let's say, the US and, and NATO, uh, as well as diverse actors like Iran, China, and Central Asia and Pakistan? Sure. Uh, my, my sense is that the more near-term threat is to Afghanistan's neighbors and other regional powers, which is going up uh, substantially. Uh, you know, Pakistan certainly faces a more important and higher capacity threat in the shape of the Pakistan Taliban, uh, which Pakistani policymakers have been understating for a while and are only starting to consider seriously uh, now, it appears. Uh, Central Asian governments are watching uh, the movement of groups like Islamic Jihad, Qadib al-Imam al-Bukhari, Jamaat Ansar, with a lot of nervousness. Um, and I think some of these governments are starting to voice that nervousness, such as the, 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 the government of Tajikistan recently. Uh, and then China, uh, which you know, initially looked like it would move in sort of quickly to recognize the Taliban, um, you know, appears not so convinced of the Taliban sort of talk on, uh, on, on terrorism. Uh, and you know, it's not hearing what it wants to hear, seeing what it wants to see. Uh, and that's because I, my sense is Chinese the sense that the Taliban are not in the move, uh, not in the mood to move against, um, you know, some of the threats that they are concerned about, like Turkestan Islamic Party, um, which is why I think China's aid to Afghanistan is around the same amount as what Al Qaeda and Bin Laden were giving to Mullah Omar before before 9/11. Uh, to be sure, the threat to the U.S. and NATO allies is there, and it's not very far off from the threat that uh, that a lot of these regional countries are facing. I think it's building up. ISIS-K is certainly committed to a major attack against the U.S. homeland, uh, and Al-Qaeda, I would note through its branch in Yemen, uh, in some of the same messaging streams in which it praises and applauds the Taliban, has again threatened major attacks against the U.S. in, in near term. So, so I think the threat against the U.S., and its NATO allies very much remains. Thanks for that. Andrew Watkins, you've been patient. Let me get to you and and start to talk a little bit about politics, but but in the context of the question, how stable is the Afghan uh, is the Taliban's uh, hold on power here? You know, on the one hand, their their military victory was quite complete. Uh, and they and they quelled the the small opposition, armed opposition that that emerged in in Panjshir. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the Taliban, one of the surprises of this situation, I think, is that the Taliban were manifestly unpopular throughout their insurgency, uh, never really showing any mass appeal. Um, so you have uh, an unpopular regime with firm military control for now and all these problems that we've just talked about over the last half hour. I mean, what's your assessment of the, of the stability of the Taliban government right now?
Yeah, thanks, Scott. And, and no problem being patient uh, with a panel like this. It's been great to hear everyone's inputs and thoughts. Um, when, when we think about the stability of, of the Taliban as a government or as a ruling regime, to me, the most important starting point is comparing how we might measure the fragility of a state versus how the Taliban themselves might measure either their strength or their effectiveness or their own fragility. What I want to do is ask not uh, how do we think the Taliban look as, as we think states should look, but what is the Taliban's conception of what a good job would be for themselves? And I think there's a really stark divide and it touches on everything that our other uh, our other speakers have have spoken about. Um, this is a group that is still mired in a militant movement's uh, modus operandi uh, across the board when it comes to how it responds to the humanitarian crisis, when it comes to the idea of the threat of terrorism or other security challenges, also when it comes to human rights and and even the core idea of service delivery. This is a group that seems to believe its job is not to serve its population, its people, but to protect them. And, and, and that's being very generous. That's giving a bit of a benefit of the doubt to the Taliban and, and, and assuming uh, benevolent intent. But we have a group that perceives everything that it does as protection over the Afghan people with a very Hobbesian take on how the world works and all of the dangers and threats that are out there. Uh, that just so happens to correspond with what this group has done best over the last 20 years, which is to uh, identify and hunt down and then attack or extinguish threats. At the time, for, for the last two decades, that threat was a government that they believed to be illegitimate. Um, today, the threats are manifold, right? And there are so many things that they just don't have the capacity or the resources to do, as Amiri noted. Uh, but if you ask the Taliban whether they've done what, what they really want to do, I, I think they might say yes. Uh, they, their, their sources of instability over the longer term is a really interesting question. Because right now, what they've demonstrated in one decision after another is that they're perfectly fine with running a government that effectively just elevates their movement, their insurgent movement, their jihadist movement into the halls of power, but transforming into a political actor, transforming into what we think of as a more conventional uh, state and all of the organs the state requires and, and, and nurtures they don't even seem to have bought in to, to that core concept of, of what we might think of as a modern state. So in that sense, it's incredibly fragile and, and there's a lot down the road uh, that might really trouble them. But if they're fine with running a, a proto-state, if they're fine with running a national scale version of their militant movement that, that uh, supplies only the most basic services, most of which would be their ideas of law and order, um, or security, then, then in that sense, they might be able to do that for quite some time. So Afghanistan is the graveyard of many things, people say, uh, among them is predictions. But I want to challenge you and, and go to the other panelists as well to try to project as you've started down this path, uh, how you see unfolding things unfolding over the next year. Uh, I think most people presume this humanitarian crisis will actually, unfortunately, get worse before it gets better. Uh, that will presumably generate a, a certain amount of, of social pressure on the Taliban, who, as we said, has, has sole control. Um, and we talked about political pressures, of course. And, and, and further, I'll, I'll prompt you for uh, some analysis that, that say there are internal divisions within the Taliban that are, that are unfolding uh, between different factions. But if you if you look at this as a I'm thinking a pressure cooker, you know where is the pressure release? Is it toward reform uh, along the lines that at least internationals and their sanctions would would hope for? Uh, is it toward a crackdown? Uh, is it toward splintering? Uh, how do you see pressure being managed in this system under the current circumstances? And I'll get your views first, but I want I want other views on that as well. 
Sure. Uh, unfortunately, I think the most likely outcome, broadly speaking, is crackdowns. Uh, and, and again, that's across the board. And I think uh, in response to a variety of perceived threats, um, that's, that's what this group uh, has, has honed and refined itself as a war fighting machine for years now, down to the individual level of, of the young men who, who've been trained and, and indoctrinated, you know, brainwashed in some ways, brought up in a system that, that is intended to teach them and to school them in doing one thing, which is, you know, overthrowing the, the previous regime, those skills and those mindsets and that mentality is geared towards cracking down on what they see as problems or, or threats or uh, dissent, as, as we've seen, even peaceful uh, dissent through speech. Um, the, the idea that this movement could move towards reform would require changing at the individual level at the, at the level of every rural pocket where the Taliban has drawn its people from, the grievances that they've come to, the, the, the worldviews that they embrace would require changing away from an idea that what we are is a movement that, that enforces uh, law and order and security through either violence or the coercive threat of violence. And it would need to transform into a very different idea of what it means to be in power. And, and what it means to you know, watch over and to rule a country's population. Um, that kind of transformation, I don't see evidence, although the Taliban is a closed and opaque movement, I don't see evidence of that vast and wide ranging intellectual transformation taking place, certainly not in the near term. But when you, you characterized it as a sort of pressure cooker situation, the severity of what's going on in Afghanistan, I would just, I, I would maybe suggest that Although the pressure is building, and this is going to be one of the world's worst crises uh, with devastating impact, it might not take that much of a release valve to release the pressure. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, look at, for instance, just yesterday's news that the Taliban plan to implement uh, a wide-ranging wheat for work program, uh, either being unable or unwilling to dip into their own cash reserves to pay civil servants' salaries, they're going to start doling out uh, rations of wheat and wheat flour to hundreds of thousands of Afghans in lieu of a monetary salary. Now, that sounds outrageous, and that could be perceived from our outside view as a serious weakness of the government. But what if things are already getting so bad, have gotten so bad inside the country, that that's actually quite a relief to many of these families, and that that might be just enough pressure uh, relieved from absolute disaster um, that, that, that we don't see things bubble up uh, quite the way we might anticipate, or at least not in the near term. Thanks. Thanks. Let me get other views. Amiri, so essentially the same question to you. I mean, amid growing pressure, do you see Taliban hardening, softening, or cracking? Uh, so to answer that, I need to give a little bit more context. I mean, Taliban is kind of entity that, uh, you know, they believe in some stuff. Like one of us is that 20 years, the international community, you know, uh, did a lot of harm to our communities, and that's why the community hate us. Therefore, the community needs kind of, you know, um, our engagement from the wise and virtue and others from religious scholars to bring them back to 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 so basically they're saying that they're not against us because you know we're bad because they say we're they're against us because you know they're influenced by the international community just to put it to, 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 in, a, in a simple way um so what so basically their plan is the way they want support in rural communities they literally plant each uh, one religious person in each family so they're kind of thinking that if people become more religious and more, so that's where they can see more people on their side. Once people are on their side, if it's worse or bad, they will support them in any situations, the way the rural communities did in the rural areas. You know, people were in a horrible situation, but did not complain because of Taliban, you know? So they just think that, yeah, that's 
the, 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 the way. So they're kind of working on the soft power to kind of have uh, community, but that's actually a miscalculation, you know? Um, I mean, there's like 39 million, I mean, 35 million, 39 million. I mean, we don't know the exact number of people living there. I mean, governance is not going to be just um, the way it was in 1990s or, you know? So uh, Taliban are actually uh, miscalculating, but Taliban also has their own problem, for example, the internal structure, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, makes it very difficult for them to make any reforms. Um, uh, you know, the narrative that comes from military commanders, you know, from middle co level commander, from local commanders, that actually shape their policies, you know, um, uh, their policies in way forward. And at the same time, some uh, lack of leadership. Uh, I mean, the thing is, the Taliban process is consultative process, you know. Uh, uh, whatever comes they have to talk to each other you know uh, and nobody wants to bring a sensitive issue for example inclusion in in these things among the topics because then he will be seen some sort of like yeah why are you advocating for such thing you know it's too early mm -hmm. And the other thing is religious scholars, uh, you know, that, uh, that, 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 that shape sort of their policies, governance and everything. That's why they called recently for a religious shura, because that will take a lot of pressure from the political actors if the religious scholar decides. Uh, look, religious scholars, you know, play a very important role uh, in their legitimacy. Their source of legitimacy is driven by the religious. No matter the whole country says anything, if the religious scholars support it, that's it. That's what you know. That that's that's what matters to them the most. So uh, that's why when uh, you know they they try to engage, uh, you know, to kind of have the religious scholars view on some of these points, some of these reforms, some of like, for example, women's inclusivity and other things. Once they have that, then that that will kind of. But still, uh, you know, on one hand they're kind of bounded by and influenced by the religious scholars. On the other hand, they're kind of influenced by the military guys. And then they're also uh, the process consultative. So that makes it the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, Taliban um, uh, dealing with the, with the local issues or the, with the Afghanistan issue, national level, very complicated, you know? Uh, and it, it, it makes it more and more, um, you know, um, uh, you know, for them to delay it further and further and give a very, uh, uh, you know, very standard uh, answers. Now that's one part. On the other part is the international community, uh, 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 the external factors uh, when it comes to the Taliban. Um, uh, policy. There's a very lack of consistency in engagement uh, from the peace talks to right now, even at this point in time. There's no consistency. Uh, what needs to be done? Taliban are thinking that it's a matter of time before everybody recognizes them. You know, uh, I mean, this needs to be clearly communicated. You know, millions of people are living day to day. We're hoping that something, you know, that tomorrow news will come, you know, and this, uh, the, the lack of international community, you know, uh, clear response to engagement. Yes, they did come up with some statements, but those statements are still not very clear. You know, sometimes uh, they say one thing, then the second times they release, they announce a couple million dollars. And, you know, they talk about the Afghan people, but there's no who are the Afghan peoples, how are they going to engage, you know, so those actually, you know, uh, sending a very mixed signals to the communities and also to the Taliban, to everyone that, you know, uh, nothing is decided, anything can go anyways. And this makes Taliban uh, think that they have the, a little bit the upper hand, Scott. Thanks. Thanks. Very interesting. So, Pawasha, just get you in on on this discussion as well. Uh, your your reactions on on how pressure will impact the the Taliban and the governance situation. But I, I wonder also if you have thoughts on 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 my thesis to begin with. Uh, how much pressure do you think will come from within Afghanistan? I think the the, the U.S. audience, the Western audience, hears overwhelmingly from. Uh, those leaders of civil society, many of whom left, uh, but who are oriented more toward uh, Western donors, Western donor programs. Of course, civil society is much broader than that. And Amiri mentioned religious leaders having great influence. Uh, there's the grassroots that, that isn't heard from. Is there 
going to be significant pressure from within Afghan society, or are they in a position of, of weakness where there won't be that much pressure on the Taliban to, to reform or improve? Oh, I think, Scott, that's a really good point. I think there is pressure internally, um, and we're seeing that by the protests that are happening when something, um, when something happens that they disagree with. Uh, the ulama have stand up, stood up. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, I think, that what Amiri was mentioning in terms of the Taliban really listening to their religious scholars is they listen to their own religious scholars within their own movement. And so we need to make a distinction between the ulama, the religious scholars within the Taliban movement that they listen to, and then the non-Taliban religious scholars here, um, who have, like I said, in some instances been able to have uh, to use their leverage um, and knowledge of Islam to make difference, but in general doesn't seem to have a huge impact overall. Um, I don't feel like the internal pressure uh, from the Afghan population. We've seen them demonstrating. We've seen them the outcry. We've seen people dying. We've seen IDPs being beaten when they're trying to go back to their land. All kinds of things are happening. It doesn't really seem to make a huge difference. Some of the protests in some of the big cities seem to have some small effects on, on certain issues, but we're not seeing that large effect overall. What does seem to make an impact is the international community and the role the international community is playing. Um, unfortunately, when the Taliban decide that they're going to focus on beheading women, uh, girl mannequins, uh, the media seems to follow that and be all uh, uh, you know up at arms that they're doing this rather than focusing on the starvation that women and children are facing in Afghanistan. Um, and so the Taliban's also lack of attention to the starvation uh, this winter will bring. I mean, there's a um, estimation that one million children will possibly die of starvation in Afghanistan this winter if nothing is done. Uh, 22.8 million Afghans are facing starvation right now in this winter. It's very, very severe. And the fact that there is, instead of focusing on how do we overcome this starvation, how do we you know, give jobs to people, how do we pay the teachers instead of preventing the teachers from going to school to work? How do we pay women? How do we give them jobs? Uh, how do we make sure that, that, that people have an income that doesn't seem to be the focus rather than some these petty issues seem to be coming up? Uh, and that's really unfortunate in terms of what we're seeing uh, play out with the Taliban. And it does seem that the international community's attention to starvation is really important here uh, and, and trying to bring some sort of relief to this. But what I, I do want to mention is that you know, just bringing wheat into the situation or rice or flour or oil isn't really going to uh, solve the problem. We've seen in the past where those kinds of things have been brought in, they spend $150 on rations and then the family actually needs the money for something else and goes and sells that for $30 and uses it for something else. It's really a huge loss. The importance is purchasing power. And how do we increase purchasing power in Afghanistan? Um, there's a number of different ways to do that, uh, to be able to get money into the hands of Afghans. I think that's really the, the key issue that the international community needs to work on and pay attention to, to save starvation in Afghanistan at this point. Thanks for that. And I, I appreciate a good segue because I want to move uh, to to a third round of, of questions, and there is an arc to this, which is, which is the current, we've heard about the current situation, we've had projections about the future, and then I want to ask initially the, the what to do about it question, and I'm also uh, going to turn to the audience uh, after this, so if you haven't put your questions in the chat, please do so, and, and we'll select from, from there. Um, let me go to U.S. Fondiar and get your kind of regional perspective on uh, how to address what you said before is a significant regional problem. We talked about terrorism, but certainly the, the collapsed economy of Afghanistan hurts regional trade. Uh, the, the more, nobody's mentioned refugees, but, but the more economic and, and hardship and hunger there is, presumably the pressure for refugees to go over into neighboring countries increases. Uh, with these risks facing the region, what do you see as their incentives for action? Are they more likely to just close the borders and harden the situation? Will they help the Taliban? Uh, how do you think the region can or will act to alleviate at least their own security risks? Sure. Yeah. Look, I think the region has a lot of tolerance for dysfunction in Afghanistan. 
really unfortunately, which uh, goes generally underappreciated. I think uh, over the last few years, we've had this uh, uh, this analytical consensus, at least here in the West, that the region is the worst affected and the region uh, you know, really wants to prevent the worst case outcome in Afghanistan. Um, but while the region you know, continuously chastises the, the United States government for its missteps, and you know, I think uh, many a times they make good points about that, we have not seen the region exert the kind of pressure on the Taliban uh, that is necessary to move them on governance, on issues of political inclusion, uh, terrorism, counterterrorism, and human rights uh, concerns. So, uh, you know, I think you could argue that the region is withholding diplomatic recognition. So in a way, uh, the region is punishing the Taliban, but I'd contend that the region is only withholding de jure recognition. De facto, uh, Taliban stands recognized. Uh, much of the region is doing, uh, is engaging with the Taliban um, you know, in, in, in multiple different ways. Uh, why is the region not uh, pushing uh, the Taliban harder? I think it's because the region has other interests in Afghanistan, which it prioritizes um, over the sources of potential spillovers due to the humanitarian disaster of the economic crisis. So, you know, China, Russia, Iran, they wanted to see the U.S. out, and their priority uh, was to sort of see the U.S. out. And I think going forward, it remains to not allow the U.S. to, again, have major political influence in, in Afghanistan. Uh, China, in particular, doesn't seem to mind further erosion of Afghanistan's economy, which is, you know, which is some, somewhat puzzling to me. For Pakistan, no surprise that it has always been keeping uh, about keeping India out. Uh, and even amid all its growing challenges with the Taliban, Pakistan is kind of content with the fact that at least the Taliban are not close to India, like the former Afghan government. Uh, so, you know, my, my depressing sort of conclusion here is that the region will not act, at least in time, or force the hand of the Taliban um, to, to fix, uh, fix things. Uh, but, you know, in the off chance uh, that the region becomes really very concerned uh, that the Taliban are this fundamental obstacle that they are the source of the current crisis and and if the if Afghanistan has to be fixed the, the Taliban have to be fixed I think we might see attempts at manipulation of the Taliban's internal politics to influence the group for more favorable governance uh, policies you know I think Pakistan could take a lead Pakistan and China could coordinate we're already seeing Iran uh, trying to do more trying to bring in the political opposition. The question is, will they will they succeed? Uh, will the region succeed? Very hard to say at this time. Uh, Andrew Watkins, how do you see the? What do you see as opportunities for the U.S. for other international actors to positively influence the situation? What are the What are the levers that will work? What should be pulled first? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Just a quick thought, uh, following up from Asmanyar's uh, points, which I agree with. Uh, I think it's absolutely correct in the broad picture. But in terms of uh, points of leverage, I think it's been interesting to see, even in the past week, uh, some of the regional powers and neighbors. Although, as Asmanyar notes, their uh, tolerance for what we might consider uh, uh, unacceptable Taliban behaviors is much greater, and, and that goes back to a completely different set of national interests and priorities that many of the neighbors have. They're also able to exercise leverage in, in a way that I think perhaps only neighbors and regional states can because of the very real tangible payoffs and quid pro quos and benefits that they might be able to offer. Um, the, the meeting that Iran seemed to uh, put together and perhaps probably insisted on between uh, the Taliban's former foreign minister and several key opposition leaders in Tehran this past week. Uh, it, on one level, that could have been largely symbolic. Uh, that may be dismissed as a, a photo opportunity for PR purposes. Uh, we've yet to see if that will turn into something more real, more substantive. But it does appear to be an instance of successful leverage of Iran, which the Taliban very intently needs uh, technical working level engagement on a number of issues, not just trade, uh, but even water rights and, and water usage between the two states, et cetera, a number of issues. 
Iran successfully leveraging uh, what the Taliban needs from them in very real terms to at least inch towards something that we've all been speaking about in very vague, abstract terms, a more inclusive system or, or inclusion of other political figures and voices. So that's an interesting point. Uh, maybe, maybe what I, I say on the US and various European and other donor states is that it's not as clear if the US or other European countries have that leverage. And I think the belief that the massive amounts of aid uh, and even development assistance that the US, uh, the EU, its member states, et cetera, are able to bring to bear, I think there's long been a hope that that can prove uh, to be a source of leverage, but you only need to look at the track record of the past 20 years. Uh, it's incredibly difficult for states uh, that are disengaged and, and are fairly... Uh, distant uh, geographically and in many other ways to exert that leverage of donor support unless they truly are willing to back off. Um, in the Taliban's case, the issue is not uh, the, the one that we had with the previous regime where we have committed all of this aid and now feel like we can't really credibly threaten to take it all away as it was with the Islamic Republic. But today, it might not even be credible the idea that we would give them as much aid as the Republic saw. And so if we think that the promise of future money and funding and engagement and benefits could tempt the Taliban into moderating, are we really serious if we make that promise, that hypothetical promise? Thanks. Thanks, Paul Asha. You mentioned you were on the on the path towards some concrete recommendations. I think with with purchasing, increasing purchasing power. Um, you referenced earlier the uh, Taliban's strong desire for international recognition, maybe that amounts to leverage. Uh, just want to invite you to continue on what would be your, your top actions and opportunities for the U.S. or other international actors to positively influence the situation. Thank you. Um, yeah, as I was mentioning, I think it's really important to think of the Afghan people and giving purchasing power to the Afghan people and supporting the Afghan people through uh, this this crisis, uh, rather than thinking about the Taliban government per se. Um, and I think that finding ways to support the people through this crisis is really important and not giving international recognition to the Taliban is really important. Um, uh, I think those are two things that we have to figure out how to uh, square the circle, because in terms of supporting the people, how do we do that without giving recognition to the government? It's a, it's a big question. Um, even though it's very clear that there's a specific list of 139 people on the sanctions list in Afghanistan, still banks are risk averse and, you know, we're still having trouble getting money to Afghanistan. It's just not going to happen. So uh, whether there's there are ways to make it very clear or to help that process, that's that's something that I, I hope could be investigated and um, some solution, some resolution could be found uh, to help the Afghan people particularly avert this crisis and, and find some way out. In terms of uh, leverage with the Taliban, um, I, I, you know, the way Andrew ended his point about whether it will make any difference, I think that's something, you know, we need to pause and think about. Uh, will giving some sort of sanctions relief on a specific issue or conditions-based issue really tempt the Taliban to change? Um, you know, we haven't really seen uh, any sort of concrete move towards that. Uh, we do have the Doha Agreement uh, with the U.S. that the Taliban signed that they have not held on their part, um, unfortunately. We, we, you know, there's so many pieces to that that we can go into, and I think uh, Aswanyar did as well a little bit, that um, that could be points where we could say, well, hey, you didn't uphold this, this, this part of your bargain. Um, and, you know, if you do uphold, then there may be some, some ways that we can work. But, it, you know, I really, I don't see any of that happening um, and making a difference. Uh, the only one thing that I was uh, thinking in terms of uh, international pressure is looking to um, 
religious scholars to ulama, particularly those that are borderline on the jihadi side that may have influence on the Taliban's movement, that are connected to political powers that the Taliban care about, that might have some way of leveraging on particular issues inside of Afghanistan that might help the situation. That's something that could possibly be an area to explore. Um, but again, I really think the international uh, efforts should be to help the Afghan people really work on um, ending starvation in Afghanistan and finding ways to get uh, help on the ground to the people and not recognizing the Taliban government at this point. Thank you. Thanks. And and just before going to uh, to audience questions, Amiri, what's the what's the biggest point of leverage and, and what should it be used for? Uh, just to add, I mean, on uh, just one point on the um, ulama or religious scholars, a lot of them, uh, the Taliban are quite popular in a lot of uh, religious scholars. That's one point. And second is that, um, look, the traditional boxes are not going to work. That's one thing we have seen. That's not going to work. There has to be a new way out. Uh, it's uh, if we just stick to the old traditional boxes and think that a different result, I think uh, it's, it's just a waste of the people of uh, Afghanistan people who's been suffering for the last uh, 40 years. So here, what I, I mean, what, what I mean, we've been uh, thinking and working with a lot of people on the ground. One of the way that we see, I mean, let's talk a little bit more practical than just, I believe, shooting in the air is that engagement with the locals. One of the things that Taliban are really afraid of engagement with the locals, you know, uh, more engagement. Um, a civil society is not, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is there. Uh, they're active. People are active. People want to participate in politics. People want to challenge Taliban on their decision. I think the international community should work with them. You know, meeting them every time, for example, I see these, uh, you know, envoys go to Kabul. They don't meet those uh, local Afghans. You know, uh, I think it's time to work with those locals if one wants to challenge the Taliban in the future, they have to have, uh, you know, they need to work with the local population. Uh, you know, one of the idea is to kind of even form a sort of like a local representations, you know, engage them every time, uh, for example, a special envoy goes there and meet with these guys. Uh, yes, it takes a lot of risk, but without risk, you will not be able to achieve anything. I mean, there's a risk. I mean, the, 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 the... so those traditional boxes, coming back to the traditional boxes, it's not going to work. Working with the locals on provincial level, local, uh, you know, uh, national level, is, uh, is 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 the best way forward. I'm not talking about the, you know, the the warlords. The, today, whatever we see is the reason of engagement with those warlords of the last 20 years. It, I'm talking about the new generations who have hope, aspirations, you know, and they're willing to do a lot of things for their country. It's not necessarily that they're against the Taliban. It's not about necessarily against the Taliban. It's about reforms. It's about uh, you know bringing something good uh, for their country. You know, if the international community ignores and, for example, right now so far what we see is uh, just humanitarian aid. You know, feeding people. That's not going to take Afghanistan anywhere, and that's not going to take uh, you know Taliban to the uh, you know to to a more reforms. What Taliban will what what will bring Taliban into more things is uh, reforms and engagement is people. You know when they know that people are actually upset when they know that you know they cannot control people when they know that you know that uh, people demand you know their rights, and that can be done by engagement. You don't have to like you know uh, you know educate them on Western philosophy or all those things. No, simple things, simple rights that the Afghan wants for themselves. Just support them on the local level, engage them, you know, uh, meet them, and on on, on all level. So uh, just as simple from my side, I think the best way is engaging the locals. That's the best way to go forward, and that will bring Taliban into a lot of. Uh, into the table to talk about a lot of things, Scott. Thanks, Paul Washer. Let me get let me get your views. You might uh, have a different perspective. Yeah. So you know, there some women are calling for another bond uh, process, similar to what Amiri was saying in terms of bringing people together. But I think even at the local level, there's been you know outcry that uh, as internationals are coming to meet the Taliban, what, where are they coming to meet the women? Where is the engagement at the local level? So if they're engaging locally with people, they also need to engage 
and, and, and make it very clear they're engaging with women. We have examples in Libya when Deborah Lyons was working on a peace agreement that she made an initiative to make sure women were in the room when she was in the room and, and really advocate for that. That made a huge difference on the peace process there. So we've, we have evidence that this is really important. Um, and that can be done in Afghanistan and a lot of those, those, those level meetings. It has to be done carefully and, of course, uh, uh, thoughtfully, but it, 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 it can happen. And that's another thing about a local meeting. The other thing is that women themselves have have repeatedly, local women in Afghanistan have repeatedly demanded to talk to the Taliban about their issues. And we haven't been able to facilitate, facilitate those kinds of conversations yet. And so again, in the same line as, as what Amiri is saying, the importance of facilitating those local conversations, we need to facilitate some of these conversations. The women want to talk about their demands to the Taliban directly. Uh, they haven't had those avenues to do that. Um, how are we supporting that kind of, those kinds of dialogues that happen at the, that can happen at the local level? So uh, those are some of the things that that you know adding on to that it's important uh, to recognize and then uh, figuring out the role that particular groups. I mean, if we're thinking about women, we also need to think about minority groups as well and their inclusion in some of these local meetings and and also thinking about. Um, how we can facilitate those kinds of conversations, whether it be locally or internationally, um, for, for, for broader inclusion. Yeah, thanks. And I'll just note that, that Secretary Blinken did just recently appoint a special envoy for addressing Afghan women's issues and broader human rights issues, uh, who, who many in the Afghan policy community know. And so hopefully there, there is now more means to, to facilitate those kinds of, uh, of interactions. Uh, let me take another question, this one from Kareem Merchant, who says, looking at the diverse approaches of the international community, won't the Taliban exploit these differences and continue to seek legitimacy from, quote, less demanding international community members? Uh, so playing one off against the other region, against the, the, the broader community. Uh, Andrew Watkins, let me get your thoughts, and then maybe I'll also bring you us fondier on that. Sure, I think I think this question speaks to a lot of what Asandia uh, was was speaking about earlier. What has interested me is watching the Taliban's own posture as it has changed. I, I suppose from some point in the thick of U.S. Taliban uh, negotiations uh, with our special representatives Ahmed Khalzad in 2019 into 2020. And then as, uh, especially with the change in the U.S. presidential administration, as the Taliban began to read the tea leaves and see that they might not get everything they had hoped to in their understanding of the Doha deal, uh, you saw a real shift in the year before their takeover of the country uh, as they sort of pivoted towards a, what I've thought of as a regional first strategy. Uh, they began to place less importance on uh, meeting benchmarks or moving with a sense of, of purpose or speed through the negotiations with Khalizad, uh, and certainly not with with representatives from the Islamic Republic for for supposed peace talks. But they really began ratcheting up their uh, regionally oriented diplomacy uh, to the extent that in the first uh, weeks after their takeover of Kabul you heard some really uh, almost ecstatic public rhetoric from some Taliban officials about the idea of cooperating with China. Um, and indeed, you, there's a sense of optimism, uh, perhaps overblown optimism, that we've heard from uh, Taliban officials and spokespersons and supporters, um, especially in the first weeks and months uh, after their takeover, the idea that the region would that they would be able to play uh, different elements of the international community off one another, that they would be able to go to, uh, for instance, China, and that China would be able and willing to put in so much of the funding that they assumed they would lose from the United States and European powers. Uh, it hasn't played out that way. Uh, China has not put forward uh, actual uh, money uh, hasn't made any firm commitments and hasn't even gestured towards the idea of, of major projects or investments coming in the near term future. And at this point, the Taliban have, if they haven't already, are beginning to look around and realize, oh, there really is only one part of the international community that ponies up the kind of money that we might need to run a state or to deliver certain services or to meet certain goals. And, and so you've seen the Taliban lurch one way, but then begin to reconsider their position. I'm not certain that they're going to be as successful as they may have thought uh, 
in terms of trying to play uh, different sides off another. Thanks for that. That's fun. Here. What's your take? So I partly agree that uh, uh, the Taliban have been able to play um, in countries off each other, have been able to exploit the lack of cohesion uh, in the international community, the lack of an international consensus on what needs to happen in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and my diagnosis is that at least since August 15th, 2021, this is because of lack of U.S. leadership uh, uh, on on Afghanistan. On, you know, on, on I, I sense that there is no real U.S. policy on Afghanistan for now. And uh, and so, you know, my prescription is that the U.S. government, the the administration, needs to take more active interest. Uh, current policy is in drift. Uh, it is unclear to me, at least, what the goal of withholding assets and blocking financial cha uh, channels to, the, uh, to Afghanistan really is. Um, that's not to say that uh, that the U.S.C. should recognize the Taliban, should be doing active business with the Taliban. I think the U.S. government needs a more calibrated coercive policy, which uh, involves proposing a roadmap, uh, conditions uh, under which uh, the relationship with the Taliban uh, can improve and conditions under which we, we might see more punishment uh, against the Taliban. I think there's a need for some real political energy, more senior level involvement. Um, and I also think that the, the multilateralism that we saw at one stage, it needs to be revived. We need a consensus among major powers on, uh, on the situation in Afghanistan. And finally, the USC has to go back to the region, uh, which, as, uh, as Andrew noted, it has more leverage, some real tools that the, that the US government doesn't. Um, and one of the threats, uh, which I think the, the international community at large, not just the US, has to put on the table is meaningful support for the Taliban's polit political opposition. Uh, right now, uh, that's been uh, that's off the table. Uh, I think uh, the political opposition, even though it was backed by the U.S. the last 20 years, is uh, not getting any real support. Um, and that, that threat needs to be on the table. Uh, and I think that provides some leverage. The Taliban are sensitive to, to, to that bad. Okay, stop there. Yeah, that's great. I, I want to continue on that and bring and bring in a question as well. I mean, you mentioned a roadmap, so that's a that's a good conceptual tool. What would be on that roadmap? So human rights concerns are one, and that's where I'll get in Annie Forsheimer's question, uh, which is what are the top human rights demands that the international community could realistically make of the Taliban in exchange for incremental improvements? Uh, to the Taliban standing or, or increases in funding. So so that's one piece, but I also want to get other thoughts on the roadmap, because you, you mentioned, importantly, the political opposition, uh, which has not been mentioned uh, very much at all. Uh, and, and I'll be the first one to say the words Karzai or Abdullah Abdullah. Uh, you know, I don't know who the political opposition is, per se, uh, but that presumably some kind of inclusive politics would be on the roadmap. Um, let me ask uh, the other panelists, you know, the human rights question, but what else would you put on a roadmap uh, that, that you could see as being uh, productive in terms of leveraging recognition, money, and, and other things? Uh, Paul Washa, let me go to you, Amiri, and then Andrew, briefly. Right. So, of course, you know, all the demands around women, women and girls' education is out there. Um, that's been something that's been loud and clear. Um, women's right to work, you know, not being as limited. All of these things are, are you know, are out there. But I think um, some of the really important pieces are around the human rights abuses that we're seeing more recently that are much more troubling um, in terms of uh, the uh, detention of women and men for uh, things that they say, either protesting or things that they say against the government, um, uh, the Taliban government. So uh, ending those kinds of uh, detentions, abductions, um, people disappearing in the night, um, stopping the unknown uh, gunmen from killing people. Those are the kinds of things that you know need to really end to show a difference um, and ending both uh, human rights abuses against women and men, uh, alongside of um, showing inclusive governance options and making sure that that women are part of the equation at all levels. Mary, what are your thoughts on both the human rights demands and, and a broader roadmap? 
I think, uh, I mean, the human rights is obviously one of the main one, but uh, besides that, it's freedom of expression, you know, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, that's uh, the other areas. One of the things is that, uh, you know, the Taliban definition of uh, national interest, uh, you know, what is, uh, you know, in, uh, national security and all those things are very narrow, you know. And um, I mean, so far they've been uh, collaborating to a large extent, especially the leadership at the local level. I think uh, the, the, the lower level commanders and fighters uh, that's a big problem on, the, on that level. So, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the thing is, like, people are, like, those superficial things, like, for example, what do you wear, you know, probably not a big thing for the international community, but that's what they interfere, even in those superficial things, you know, like, what are you wearing, why you cut your beard, why you have long hair, why you have this kind of hair, you know, like, those, like, simple things for an Afghan. So my point is to look at not just from the international perspective, if you want to be succeeded in Afghanistan, look at from the Afghan perspective. You know, if you want it, you want to depend something. Yes, I mean, there are some national, you know, there's standard things that, you know, you want to put it in those standard terminologies. But, but before you put it in those standard terminologies, what you need to do is actually map it up. What are those things? Um, so for Afghans, I mean, they just need like uh, political inclusions, like especially the youth. I mean, uh, they studied a lot of things. They want to play uh, a, a bigger role. It's not about, you know, I mean, nobody is a big, um, you know, I mean, from my perspective, it's a big, uh, you know, thing of uh, elections. But what they want is some sort of representation, you know, how, what that representation will be. That's a question, you know, like, for example, we had in the, the King's Arshatan, we had so representation, inclusivity, freedom of expressions and human rights. Those are some of the, the, the things. And also, you know, the, the personal sphere, which is one of the main thing. I know it's not a big thing for for the international community. But if you go to Kabul and, 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 and other major urban centers, that's one of the main issues. The people are really afraid and scared. And, you know, uh, so, so I, will, I will say these are the, the few things that I think are important. Thanks. Any additional points from you, Andrew? Yeah, uh, a thought or two. Um, I appreciate in, in format Forsheimer's uh, question uh, the, the need to be pragmatic and realistic about what the international community uh, especially western states and donors can reasonably go to the Kabul, uh, to the Taliban and, and ask them to to consider and and to work with them on i think one thing that the Taliban as a movement have postured themselves and and have tried to demonstrate uh, not just to the international community but but to Amiri's point to Afghans and and domestically as a movement something they believe in and and, and uh, care about strongly is the idea of anti-corruption. Um, the Taliban, in order to survive as an insurgency, uh, made a lot of deals with the various devils, uh, ranging from smuggling from the country's vast narcotics production and illicit trading uh, industry and sector, uh, but, but a whole host of other uh, illicit activities. And this was something that they did to survive in order to achieve their goal and to move forward. But they're in a really unique position now where they can either uphold their own rhetoric uh, about anti-corruption, about uh, the purity of their movement and of striving towards a more Islamic system, or they can permit the same kinds of hypocrisies and corrupt practices and, and money-making activities to go on as, as the prior Afghan government, uh, to, to be quite frank, and, and so many other uh, central governments in Afghanistan have in the past. This notion of uh, whether or not they will take anti-corruption seriously is something that I think the international community has a window on, maybe not through the United States directly, but certainly through uh, the UN mission and its agencies, its presence on the ground. It has field offices that don't just sit in Kabul, but stretch out across the country. I think there's a real opportunity for number one, dialogue at a more local, at least provincial level. And number two, potentially even monitoring, uh, holding the Taliban to account uh, if you say to your own people that you will do X and Y, why not allow us to come and observe and, and to see that being demonstrated? And that could be the monitoring of, of uh, over time, a more robust uh, form of pressure, first monitoring and, and then you know, discussion about the very basics of, of rule of law and not rule by might. Thanks. Thanks. I want to 
interject my own my own question here because I think this point about inclusion has been made, and I and I want to continue to try to to drill down on on what inclusion means, what inclusion might look like. Uh, and Amiri, I also appreciated your use of the word representation, uh, and and that relates to the what I asserted was the the fundamental unpopularity of of the Taliban, at least as an insurgent movement. You know. We have an interim government now, self-declared interim government by the Taliban. You know, what is it that raises the question of what a permanent government might look like? And it raises the question of what a process for a permanent government might look like. So in this space from interim to permanence, you know, do we have any indications of how the Taliban plan to structure uh, a longer term government? How will they represent people? How will they include people? Amiri, I'll go to you back on that, but I welcome other thoughts. Oh, that's a, that's a very important question because that's what's been discussed among a lot of Afghans. Uh, they're trying to pitch all kinds of ideas to the Taliban, but Taliban so far literally does not want to even say a word. You know, they just say, well, this is the government, that's it. And they do not just go further like, well, this will be forever the kind of government that we want, you know? So they kind of do not want to go further down the, and share what, uh, what how it's going to look in the future. Future. But like I say, Afghanistan, like all the governments, uh, you know, Taliban are also reactionary. If they see something moving, they will react to that and, you know, make a certain decision. Um, it, that's That was one of the reasons why, because this was initially the actual government that they would announce. But then after like a lot of, uh, you know, discussions, uh, discussions and a lot of, uh, you know, on international uh, media and uh, a lot of actors, they actually came under sort of pressure to announce this as an interest government not as a as the government you know mm -hmm. so if so see that's one of the things so for, i mean uh, right now i mean the questions a lot of Afghans ask is what is the internal legitimacy of the taliban you know um, and how the state is going to look under the taliban and uh, you know what is the constitutions that the taliban hasn't uh, really provided any answers to those things i mean right now the amir just appoints people he doesn't really interfere much in the local politics and implementation in those things it's uh, i mean so far that we see is mostly uh, the, the the appointments. Um, I mean, th there is. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, I mean, I always tell people that we lost the change Taliban the very last minute. You know, Taliban were changed. You know, when before the, the we lost it the very last minute when the the, the, the republic collapsed um, um, collapsed in in, uh, in August. Uh, so that kind of you know all the things that they thought of it kind of you know wa washed up, especially the Taliban leadership and they kind of got themselves in a situations that where they kind of thought like well there's no need for anything because everything has just you know we got everything you know there's um, the international community give up and you know even in back then there was a chance even like in early august there was a chance of some sort of um, you know even taliban controlling Kabul, there was a chance of some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, bringing uh, taliban into some sort of uh, engagement with the, with the political um, with the other political opposition so um, uh, I mean, so the, 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 the good point is that just, I don't know how it will look in the future, but the good point is that there is a chance. So that's the most important thing. It's not about what it would look like. The good thing is that there's a chance to shape in, you know, if Taliban is going to remain as a government, there's a big chance to make a lot of, you know, to, to put pressure to bring a lot of reform and changes. It's how, it's a, it's a million dollar question. It needs a lot of more time. Scott. Thanks. I'll watch a million dollars on the table for the how. Uh, what's your, what do you see that there's a chance and, and how do you see uh, the Taliban maybe moving from interim exclusive to maybe permanent, more representative or inclusive? Yeah. So in terms of the process that Mary was talking about in terms of the, that there was a, a different kind of a Taliban that could have taken over that was more progressive and we might have gone to something different, but then we lost that chance. I think that, you know, those elements are still in the Taliban. And so we, we have these different groups within the Taliban and they are at odds with each other. And we, we saw, you know, some of that play out where Mullah Brother had to go to Kandahar because, you know, they couldn't get along in, in Kabul. So, so there are these groups and tensions. We still have yet to see who, you know, how that will play out and what will happen. And um, I do think that, 
you know, the regional countries and international um, community has a role to play in supporting various groups within the Taliban to support some of those uh, uh, more inclusive approaches or different approaches. I think that that's something that has to be considered clearly because there are those tussles and tensions. And what happened with the, the current announcement of the government was also, uh, you know, supported by regional powers in order for, for this government to be announced. So, so that tension needs to be recognized. Um, in terms of, you know, what will happen next or what the process will be, it's a, it's a good question. I think that there's a lot of options within Islamic governance. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the different models, even within Hanafi jurisprudence, within Islamic governance, looking at the uh, the rightly guided caliphs of the, in the early times, how head of state was elected, inclusive processes that already exist within Islam. And, you know, if there is appetite for looking into those models, there's a lot of hope that there, you know, we could have a different kind of governance system. The question is, is there still appetite? And what are the different powers within the Taliban in terms of who went out over, over these different arguments? And I think that has yet to play out. Great. Let me ask the, the final question now. We've had several in the chat that, that get to the question of leverage. Who has the leverage and how to use it? I think we have been talking about that. Um, I'll ask one in particular and use that as an invitation for, for final thoughts. Uh, Julia asks more specifically about the, the reserves, the central bank reserves, uh, almost $9 billion that are that are frozen, uh, and says, is it in the interest of the international community to put Afghanistan in the same situation as, as Iran or Venezuela? With no access to foreign reserves, it doesn't seem to foster progress in the long term. Um, you know, I want to broaden that. You can you can take that on, but also just broaden that to to this question that is underlying a lot of the debate. You know, do we want the Taliban to succeed or to fail? You know, how do we how do we support the state but not the government? Um, you know, final point question on, on leverage uh, is the international community or even the U.S. Let's say acting against its interest by starving the state of resources? Uh, or is that, in fact, a, a productive lever to get the changes that we want? Andrew, let me go to you first. Uh, I'll do us and then see if, if there are any other points quickly. Thanks, Scott. It, it really is the key question. Uh, and, you know, the, the U.S. government still seems to be grappling with that question and how it wants to answer uh, as many other uh, previous donor states. The I think what Pawasha was just describing gets to the heart of this question. While the U.S. and other states deliberate over whether or not they want to see the Taliban succeed or, or whether or not there is a way to keep the state alive without strengthening this movement or perhaps getting some moderation or, or uh, good behavior out, out, of the, out of the Taliban, Every day that goes by while we're either deliberating or waiting to see how things go, that's one day, one more day that the more militant aspects of this movement, that the more extremist aspects of this movement are engaged in internal debate within the Taliban. And they get to say to whichever moderates may exist, to whichever uh, personalities within the Taliban may want to do more in terms of service delivery or of a truly inclusive uh, uh, form of governance. That's when the more militant minds get to say, see, they don't want us to succeed. They don't want to work with us. They have nothing to do with us. They're just waiting for us to fall apart. There's great risk and there's no guarantee that we're going to be rewarded with more moderate Taliban behavior if we as the international community engage. But every day that we don't and we sit back, we're only strengthening the hands uh, of those voices within the Taliban who, who feel as if they don't need us at all and as if they have their own draconian way of running a country um, with, with brutality and the bare minimum. Thanks. Thanks. Amira, you were nodding. Just very briefly, do you, do you agree? What's your quick, very quick take? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Andrew on this point. Uh, the more the U.S. and international community wait and, you know, thinking that, you know, Taliban will collapse or, you know, they will come to, uh, the more they will crack down on the locals and strengthen their positions inside the country. Once they are in better positions than uh, bringing them or squeezing them, uh, squeezing any uh, other deal out of them will be even more difficult, you know? I mean, the uh, Taliban has the potential to turn
turn things into much more uh, into much more problems. Um, uh, so, and, and the only way is, I, I mean, at this point in time, is uh, engagement, and not just engagement, like uh, just you know providing them with assistance. I mean, this, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the reserve. I mean, those uh, that directly benefit them should, yeah. I mean, to some extent, can be whole, but but those large some of that actually it goes to the population, the Afghan people. Um, I think that's 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 gonna make Taliban more popular and uh, eventually, you know, uh, and and uh, will make them stronger and push for more crackdown and co- further control. Uh, and and that would be uh, and that will have a horrible consequences. That's fine, dear. Um, look, I'm most concerned about uh, terrorism issues. I mean, that's my beat. That's what I follow. Uh, Taliban ties with all these groups that have been documented um, in, in my writing. I spoke about them. Uh, that said, these financial reserves are not a source of leverage for counterterrorism issues. Uh, and most certainly not the 900 or so million dollars of uh, savings of, of you know, ordinary Afghans. I, I think they're not a source of leverage. They are not going to change the behavior of the Taliban. And uh, I think the international community at large and the U.S. government in particular have uh, misdiagnosed sources of leverage. At one point, the Doha process was touted as a source of leverage, um, that it would provide the Taliban with international recognition, but it wasn't. Uh, So I think the U.S. government needs to more carefully identify leverage, and in this context, uh, in the current situation, do the right thing by uh, letting uh, the Afghan people um, have their money uh, back. And and I would, you know, make a strong case for looking for some real sources of leverage. And I go back to uh, to support for the political opposition. I think it is uh, going to make the Taliban really unhappy, uh, and the US, you know, the international community at large needs to very seriously uh, consider that. Thanks. Very briefly, Pawashi, you have the final word. Wow, Scott, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I agree with us when in terms of, you know, these, the money not being the leverage at this point, particularly, uh, those that are it's owned by the Afghan people. And I think we have to go back to figuring out what is best for the Afghan people. Um, and, you know, I think it's a very difficult question to unravel in terms of how do you support the Afghan people, but not support the Taliban? How do you support the success of, of, of a country uh, while not supporting the Taliban. And we have some clues here from um, Andrew Watkins telling us about um, how there, there are these in, internal dynamics and, and, and how we need to understand that, as well as supporting the people and the people's voices, as Amiri mentioned. Um, and I think within that, we need to be, pay particular attention to uh, women and, and to minorities uh, as we're moving forward to make sure that the Afghan people are successful and come out successfully from this and are able to, um, to save the crisis this winter particularly. Um, and I think that's in everybody's minds at this point. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, panelists, for, for really useful insights. Uh, thank everybody in the audience for watching. I think I'm going to end with the three-word takeaway, which is the need for inclusion, uh, sorry, the, the need for engagement. Uh, I've heard that a lot. Uh, the need for representation uh, and also the, the need for um, respecting human rights. So I'm going to end on that and thank everybody for their interest and we'll continue this conversation as events unfold.